When I really knew something was wrong was when I started having trouble walking up the stairs. I was supposed to be grateful and happy and healing and well and thriving, but I did not feel that way. I was so sick. Like always, I wanted to find an answer and I had to figure it out, and I had to figure it out to save my own life. So I dove in. Jill is the leading voice in biotoxin illness and chronic conditions that are driven by toxicity. Oh my gosh, you're dealing with mold? You have to work with Dr. Jill Carnahan. Dr. Jill was the first person that actually began to shed some light on the problem. What I do is listen to the patient and we together talk about what else is possible. I don't know why I'm crying. <laughs> saved my life. The deepest lessons and most profound insights come in the suffering, come in the dark moments. Self-compassion is the healing transition that, that shifts something inside of us. It's actually the thing that we need most in order to heal. Dr. Patient. Available now at DrPatientMovie.com. Welcome to Resiliency Radio, your go-to podcast for the most cutting-edge insights in functional and integrative medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Jill. In each episode, we delve deep into the heart of healing and personal transformation. Join us as we connect with renowned experts, thought leaders, and innovators at the forefront of medical research, empowering you with knowledge and inspiration on your journey to health. Today, I am absolutely excited to introduce you to my guest, Dr. Raymond Singer, a board-certified forensic neuropsychologist specializing in neurotoxicology. He testified in several groundbreaking litigation cases, expanding the rights of people to get compensation for neuropsychological injuries from toxic neurotoxic chemicals. He served as an expert witness in the landmark age witness in the case against Agent Orange Vietnam veterans litigation, which resulted in the largest settlement at that time for toxic chemical injuries. He was recently featured as an opinion uh, featured in an opinion by the United States Supreme Court. Dr. Singer, welcome so much. We're excited to have you here. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, we've got a lot to talk about. Before we dive into neurotoxicology and forensics, tell us a little bit about how did you get into this area of medicine and, and testifying um, for clients? How did you get into this pathway? Well, it goes back a long way. <clears throat> when I was a graduate student in Washington State University, and uh, I was watching TV one day, and actually it was a black and white TV, and I saw an image of Dr. Irving Selikoff at the top of the Annenberg Building in New York City talking about his work in environmental toxicology. And I, I was so inspired by his words, his actions, his demeanor, and the work that he was doing uh, that... Uh, well, it, it didn't it didn't go any it didn't go beyond that at the moment until years later when I was in New York City, I was asked by my sister's who's a psychologist, my sister's friend who was working for Dr. Selikoff, and she was pregnant and she wanted me to substitute for her on a trip to Michigan State to conduct research on neurotoxicology. And I, I was at that moment, I was a postdoctoral fellow at New York University, but I, I managed to get this, this a couple of weeks off to join the team. And we went to Michigan State and we I can tell you about the research we did there. Yeah. But uh, this was under the direction of Irving Selikoff, the man who brought asbestos to the world's attention. Yes. Wow. And he just was a, the premier, the premier, I believe, the premier public health doctor of his day. So uh, he he brought me into the program, and uh, 
there is where I learned neuropsychology, neurotoxicology, epidemiology, some more statistics, and was inspired to, to go out and, and apply the knowledge that, that, that we learned there. We we went all we went in various places around the country to examine workers exposed to solvents, lead, mercury, pesticides, and Agent Orange. And it was my work doing nerve conduction velocity assessments wow. of Agent Orange uh, workers that led later to my being hired on the Agent Orange litigation. Yeah, because the, the the work I did was, uh, I guess, groundbreaking, showing the neurotoxicity of Agent Orange. Yeah, this is so needed. That's why I'm so excited to be here with you today. Because here I am. I'm a medical doctor in clinical practice, and every single day, one of my areas of expertise is how the environmental toxic load and the toxicants and toxins in our environment affects our bodies. And it's something that sadly, most medical professionals are very um, unaware of. And to me, it's the elephant in the room of all of our immune dysfunction and our brain dysfunction and our rising rates of Alzheimer's disease. And again, you're going to talk a lot about this. I'd love to frame this with a quote from your website, which is a full of resources, it's neurotox.com. And it says at the very top, neurotoxicity Neurotoxicity is a cause of brain damage. Common symptoms can include problems with memory, concentration, reaction time, sleep, thinking, language, as well as depression, confusion, personality changes, fatigue, numbness of the hands and feet, and many, many more things. Many of the nervous system disorders could be caused by a neurotoxicology or neurotoxicant, including numerous neurologic and psychological disorders. Now, again, you and I know this, but for those kind of listening, what um, percentage of people that are experiencing neurological or psychological or symptoms like that do you think could be um, at the core potentially a toxin? It, it can be very large, uh, in part because, as you know, and, and as your listeners might know, the, the brain itself doesn't have pain receptors. So if it gets, the, 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 the covering does, the yeah. dura, and, but the brain itself doesn't have pain receptors. So when, if people are injured by a toxic substance, they won't necessarily feel yes. the pain. Now, headaches can result from the inflammation and, and so forth and the inflammation of the blood vessels and, and the dura, but um, it, it may not be an initial symptom. So unfortunately, we can suffer from neurotoxicity and, and not be aware of it. Like uh, like the big problem with lead that we've had in our society, lead pain and, and lead and gasoline and people getting injured. And, and that's, it's pretty subtle because it's the brain injuries are also relatively cumulative. Yes. So once you get an injury, it's 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 difficult to to recover. Uh, although some doctors are well versed in how to bring about that recovery, but most doctors are not. Yeah. So um, with with the loss with with the with the accumulation of a brain injury, and possibly the synergistic effect of different chemicals that we might be exposed to. For example, lead or in the environment or mold or um, pesticides in the food supply. Uh, that's why I encourage everyone to eat organic produce because the pesticide residues are remain in the, in the food stuff as well as the GMO aspect of the food supply and the roundup that's put onto the GMOs that gets into the food supply. So this unfortunately leads to an assault on, on us and on the brain of a variety of toxic chemicals that our body has to deal with and manage. And if it's a small amount, yes, we are detoxification systems will work yeah. fine and We'll be able to detoxify, but if it's a large amount, then then it's it's taxing, and we um, 
we may suffer from silent brain damage that can result in in all the symptoms that that you mentioned because the brain controls uh, every, all behavior. It controls the nervous system. It controls the heart rate. It controls digestion, sleep, personality, memory, energy levels, and, and on and on and on. And uh, one of the one of the interesting interesting from a neurotoxicological point of view, but unfor- but unfortunate is that any part of the brain can be affected by toxic substances. <clears throat> so any function of the brain can be injured by toxic substances. And sometimes it, it could result in, in, in strange types of behaviors yeah. and strange types of problems. But more typically, more commonly, there's problems with short-term memory, yeah. learning, reaction time, psychomotor speed. Long-term memory tends to remain, but more recent memories start to fade and new memories can, for many people can't even be formed. And another um, undiscovered aspect, an untalked about aspect of neurotoxicity is its pervasive effect on personality. Yes. And this this is rarely studied in neuropsychology or neurotoxicology. But in my years of working with people with chemical exposures, I guess probably in the thousands, Mm -hmm. and administering personality tests to many of them, I can tell you that personality is often affected and um, often damaged by the exposures. And it could be secondary to the loss of function, or it could be a primary effect from on the brain areas that control personality, which must be pretty widespread. Did you want to ask a question or should I keep going? Oh, gosh, I love this. Well, a couple of thoughts, and then I want you to keep going. First thing is I love, I just want to reiterate, toxic load is a concept that you're talking about. I've talked about a lot too, where you often were born and we're born in this world 20 years ago, the cord blood of infants had over 200 chemicals from a Canadian study. So we often come into the world with toxic load. And then as we uh, accumulate in our environment, and like you said, I think it's really important to understand that sometimes we can tell, but many times we are inhaling or ingesting or getting exposed through the skin or through the air, these chemicals, and we don't even know it. And one concept that I wanted to highlight was insight. I've seen this with mold. Insight is the ability in real time to understand what's happening. And many times with chemical exposures, and in my experience with mold, you lack the insight. It's actually almost sabotages your ability to know in real time what's happening. You might look back later and say, oh, that was so strange, that behavior or that lack of memory. And you may put it together in hindsight, but in the real time, we often don't realize how much it's affecting us. Is that true? That's absolutely true. And and many of my clients think that they're going into Alzheimer's disease because of, the, because of what they're experiencing. And actually, the symptoms of neurotoxicity are very similar to Alzheimer's disease. Mm-hmm. In fact, you could almost say indistinguishable because Alzheimer's disease is um, it's a diagnosis that people get when they have certain symptoms. But the cause of Alzheimer's disease is probably not plaques. Correct. <laughs> oh, it's interesting that we have similar viewpoints on this. Yeah. Dr. Bredesen, who's a teacher in how to reverse Alzheimer's and looking at all the underlying cause, will actually say that one in three of his young people with I'm talking young, 40s, 50s, early 60s with Alzheimer's are related to mold toxicity. And maybe that's a good transition because we both love to talk about mold. What are maybe some of the interesting cases or things you've seen related to the mycotoxins that mold produces and how it affects brain and personality and some of these things? Oh, <clears throat> well, I've, I've seen a lot of mold clients. I actually started studying mold neurotoxicity in 1999 Wow! when a professional nurse organization asked me to give a talk on it. I said, I don't know anything about it. I said, well, find out about it and come and talk to us about it. So I did that. And I've testified in many mold cases over the years. Um, uh, 
two mold cases come to mind. One was of a family exposed to mold in, in, in a region where there was a lot of uh, unusual amount of rainfall and an unusual infestation uh, then of mold in, into their home over a period of time. And, and uh, the little girl in the family, she developed an autism-like condition, autistic-like condition, and was actually quite destructive, self-destructive and threatening, She's threatening her parents with violence. So she was just a little girl. She yeah. couldn't she couldn't perpetuate violence, but it 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 modified her personality and her emotions as well as her ability to think. And she um you know she suffered from that. Another mold case that I worked on, uh, it included other toxic chemicals, but this was a, a criminal case in uh, a man who lived in, in a moldy, in a, a moist part of the country in a trailer that was very moldy, uh -huh. visible mold in the trailer. And he uh, he eventually he lost his mind. Yeah. And he went out and he, well, I hate to, you know, bring up bad things, but he shot and killed a bunch of people. Yeah. including uh, a law enforcement officer who was a friend of his oh. and he said he was he said he was going he was cleansing the land for hispanic people mm. he was part hispanic mm -hmm. he was cleansing the land for hispanic people so he got these delusions into his into his mind that were partly induced by the mold and and my colleague at the at the time took samples, and we think that there may have been a variation of LSD mm. in the walls and on the pillows from the various mold mycotoxins that were um, that were emitted. Yes. Uh, but I'll talk a little bit more about the case, and then and then we can go sure. into something else. So. Um, what was interesting about the case is that uh, he he was he was he was set for the death penalty, and uh, we were able to show the show the court that there were mitigating circumstances yeah. to what caused him to go insane mm -hmm. and to commit these horrible, tragic crimes. But we were able to show the court that neurotoxicity, including mold. Yeah. And alter the brain, the structure, the function of the brain, and lead to permanent changes that can alter a person's ability to control their impulses, to judge, to manage their behavior. Mm -hmm. And um, and in this case, he was spared the death penalty, and he was put into a a, a, a beautiful psychiatric facility where I had ex actually examined him uh -huh. in the state. A very, uh, very nice facility, but it, unfortunately he still was mentally ill and he got a girlfriend to try and have him break out of the jail. Oh. <laughs> so well, the last I heard he was put yeah. into state prison. Hey everybody, I just stopped by to let you know that my new book, Unexpected Finding Resilience Through Functional Medicine, Science, and Faith is now available for order wherever you purchase books. In this book, I share my own journey of overcoming life threatening illness and the tools and tips and tricks and hope and resilience I found along the way. This book includes practical advice for things like cancer and Crohn's disease and other autoimmune conditions, infections like Lyme or Epstein Barr, and mold and biotoxin related illness. What I really hope is that as you read this book, you find transformational wisdom for health and healing. If you want to get your own copy, stop by readunexpected.com. There you can also collect your free bonuses. So grab your copy today and begin your own transformational journey through functional medicine in finding resilience.
and I, it's probably going to be there for a while. Well, and I've often wondered, like, because some of the most affected water damage buildings are civic, like courthouses and prisons and schools. And again, you and I know how much this can affect brain. I, I have several school systems that I work with kids. So we know there's water damage and it's affecting. I can document their learning or IQ there is gone down in certain situations. Um, and then there's another story I have. I've mentioned this on on air before, but I have a friend who had a house who was massively affected by stachybotrys, which produces some really bad trichosethene toxins. And they didn't know this, but later they looked into it. And the previous owners, like several times back, there was two homicides and a suicide in that home. And I have oh. no doubt that it's connected to those mycotoxins because it really does change brain function. So keep going with some of these cases fascinating, but I get it. And it's so real. And I actually love that you're bringing awareness because I think, especially my patients, sometimes feel like, what is wrong with me? You know, I can't think clearly or, um, or a lot of times I'll see relationships or marriages break up because of the personality changes. Um, so you, you and I both know this really affects people so profoundly. Yeah. I would say that very often families break up mm -hmm. over yeah. Sometimes over mold, but yeah. over neurotoxicity in general. Mm -hmm. But I've seen a lot of family problems. Yeah. Uh, because this, even if, even if they realize what's causing it, yeah. it's the changes in personality and behavior yeah. are so profound that they just, the spouse just sometimes just can't take it anymore. Yeah. What are some of moles I could talk about all day long? And we both know there's profound effects. One thing I thought too, when you're saying that is the Salem witch trials, they think now in hindsight that there was some mycotoxins in the grains that affected them like LSD, which makes sense of that test that you mentioned. Had you come across some of that data from those, year, you know? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's that's what I thought about when in this case mm -hmm. uh, where they, they found LSD or LSD-like substances. Unfortunately, my colleague, who was the premier expert in mold, Jack Thrasher, I don't know if you know him. Yes, I do. Okay, well, you know, he, he passed away. And uh, it's a tremendous loss. And also Kate Kilburn. Yes. Uh, another leader in the field, he passed away. So um, unfortunately, uh, the leaders passed away. Another occupational hazard is they lose their licenses to practice yes. medicine. Uh, for diagnosing uh, mold toxicity. Yeah. Fortunately, um, I think things are shifting a little, but it has been, it's a, it's really crazy because in, for those listening the, in medical school, we're taught that it's an allergen. That is true. But what we're talking about, this is a whole inflammatory innate immune system dysfunction that it massively affects cognition and brain and immune function and so many other levels. And it's not just an allergen. Right. Right. Uh, um. Okay, I'll, I'll get back to it. There's, okay, I've been, I've been thinking about this about multiple chemical sensitivity. Yeah. I've I've worked in many of those cases also. Yeah, and well, some um, of the other common things you see as toxicants or toxin exposures in some of the cases, I'm sure there's solvents and there's metals and there's chemicals like pesticides, like we talked about. Do you want to share some of the different kinds of cases that you've come across that have affected people very dramatically that maybe our listeners wouldn't be aware of? Oh well. Uh, yeah, pesticides. Mm -hmm. You do have to watch out for those, and and I, I am actually currently working on a case of people with with pesticide exposure from uh, from exterminators mm -hmm. who who misapplied the pesticides in the homes. Yeah, yeah. There is another another hidden toxin I wanted to talk about: toxic substance. That, that can affect modern homes. <clears throat> Beware if you have uh, foam insulation to insulate your walls in your home. Beware of if, if it's if it's misapplied. Mm -hmm. It can continue to outgas okay. into the home environment and put out methylene diisocyanate mm -hmm. as well as the flame retardant forever chemicals mm -hmm. can uh, can also be emitted from these substances. And I'm working on a case where a whole family was affected by this. It, it was a a family that that 
built their dream house on a hundred acres of land and it had everything in it and they wanted it to be really well insulated. And unfortunately, the app, the uh, people applying the substances applied it too thickly and it then consequently took a long time to outgas and out had to outgas a lot. So uh, that's one thing to be aware of in ho home insulation. Hmm. Um, pesticides. What about, um, have you had cases where other materials in the home, like formaldehyde or off-gassing of things on cabinets or flooring or maybe uh, flame retardants, um, any yeah. kinds of cases? Because it seems like the home, we want this to be this wonderful safe place, right? But what ends up happening is if there's water damage or there's new materials that we're not aware of, sometimes the home can be the problem because it's off-gassing or contributing to the toxic air quality inside. Yes. Yes, for sure. Formaldehyde is less of a problem these days. Mm -hmm. And I am I think it's because we raised such a fuss about it when, when it was first so widely used a couple of decades ago. And when we participated in litigation against the formaldehyde uh, uses in companies. And now there seems to be much less of it in used in products. Yeah. But I, I would be careful in uh, mobile homes. I'm not sure because that, that's a pretty closed environment. Mm -hmm. um, what about, we mentioned before we get on here that sometimes uh, psychiatric drugs can have effects. And I know I've seen cases, I'm sure Ambien is one of those that you've seen do some strange things and maybe the SSRIs. Do you want to tell us a little bit about sometimes how these drugs may have unintended effects and how you might have seen that play out in the courtroom? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, so psychiatric drugs, um, read the labels very carefully because a lot of times you could you find warnings on the labels mm -hmm. of what could possibly happen. And the drug companies, you know, it's good to put them on the labels so people can know that. But many of these psychiatric drugs that are designed to, to improve mental health have been linked with violence, mm -hmm. aggression, hostility, homicide, reports of homicide. If you look in the uh, VAERS, the, uh, I forget what the acronym stands the for. The reportable uh, uh, injuries yeah. from meds, yeah. Mm -hmm. If you look on the, on the reports, which I did. So I've been involved in several criminal cases where people actually committed murder. Mm -hmm. And I was able to to uh, link that to the psychiatric drugs that they were taking. And typically, typ the typical scenario goes like this. A person is not feeling well. They have some depression or whatever the problem is, anxiety. They go to their doctor, typically it's, may say a GP, general practitioner, or and maybe not a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. And they have prescribed the drug and they come back to the doctor a little while. They say, you know, I'm feeling worse with this drug. Uh, what can you do? And then, then may, they may double the dosage yeah. or more. Mm -hmm. or they may add another drug. Mm -hmm. And then and then, then, they, then the person that's taking the drugs is taking uh, way too many drugs that's causing mental disturbances. Yeah. And then the practitioner may suddenly take one of the drugs away, which leads to the the uh, the, the, the withdrawal the, the symptoms. Withdrawal or... symptoms, and uh, the abrupt withdrawal syndrome from from mm -hmm. the from the abrupt withdrawal, and uh, then maybe add another drug. Anyway, this goes on, and uh, unfortunately. Um, Sometimes it's a spouse that that that, that could become the, the victim of of a person who who develops just a, a psychotic break yeah. and um goes into a, a rage and, and commits murder. And um so I've worked on these cases and and another interesting aspect of the case is that even 
when we can demonstrate that the person had diminished responsibility for what they did, it the person still has remorse. Yeah. Because they still they they did it. They know they did it. And and maybe a drug impaired their ability, impaired the but but here they did it and, and then they suffer a terrible loss yeah. of someone that they loved, that they still love. And it's, it's 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 a terrible tragedy all around. So I just encourage people if you're taking psychiatric drugs and you're having adverse effects, uh, or you're or you're having a worsening of effects, to talk to your doctor and tell them the you know that you're you're not feeling well, and um, ask the doctor to consider whether it's an adverse effect of the drug. Yeah. Don't don't stop taking drugs uh, without a doctor's supervision. Because that itself can have an adverse effect. Yes, you're right. These things are very, very powerful, and I couldn't agree more. And we really, as a physician, we need to monitor if our patient is taking them. But also, as a if you're a patient and you're out there and it's not working, or you like you mentioned, I'm a general practitioner and I know my limits. And so, some cases like those, I would make sure a psychiatrist or an expert is involved. And that's another thing you could do as a patient if you're out there and concerned about your, you know medications, you could see an expert in that area to make sure that you have good, proper supervision. So I really like that you mentioned that. Um, have there been, uh, you know, we've had a lot of the Gulf War and, or the, I'm sorry, the um, Agent Orange and some of those things. I want to talk a little bit about that, but there are these cases where either an environmental, um, like some of the the trains that exploded and the chemicals and the environment, have you been involved in any of these places where there's a lot of people in an area affected by a certain chemical? Hmm. Not that many of that. More specific, okay. Not that many. Tip typically I'm hired now by a, a lawyer mm -hmm. who represents an individual. Got it. With with the problem. Oh, okay. And uh one of the problems, just generally speaking, with with um class action litigation mm -hmm. is it doesn't often the individual doesn't gets lost in the shuffle yeah and uh, maybe the group gets money and the lawyer gets lots of money yeah. and they settle the case and that that's great for them but the individual may not get the compensation that they want yeah. or they need mm -hmm. but i i did want to talk about um another general topic sure which which i would call the the neurotoxicity of warfare yes was that that's a huge source of neurotoxicity in our society. Mm -hmm. And uh, just just to review the Agent Orange litigation, because some, some of your listeners may not be as old as I am and may not remember what went on. Yeah. But uh, Agent Orange is, a, is an herbicide that was used to de defoliate the forest so that the American pilots and bombers could see the Vietnamese... Um, adversaries the Viet Cong as they as they traversed the Ho Chi Minh Trail and other places and so they would use tremendous amounts of these herbicides to defoliate the forest which actually is the forest is, the area the land is still contaminated with dioxin wow. from from mm -hmm. these uh, from these these efforts and of course the Vietnamese were affected by the Agent Orange and uh, so the dioxin is a contaminant of the Agent Orange from the 245T to, yes. to a large extent. It wasn't meant to be there, but it got there. And dioxin is, at the time, was considered, and maybe still is, one of the most toxic substances known to man. Yes. So, uh, so I feel sorry for the Vietnamese who have been exposed to it, but also our, our service men and women that were there were exposed to the Agent Orange during its handling it, it's mm -hmm. loading up the devices to spray it during the spray of it. And the manufacturer uh, didn't tell the people that, well, yeah, it could be neurotoxic. Mm -hmm. There's some studies that show, you know, in rats and so forth. Well, they, they know or they should have known that it was neurotoxic when they were 
giving it such a widespread application. Yeah. And um, so that's how the, the Vietnam veterans, they were able to sue the chemical companies for this uh, problem. They couldn't, the servicemen are unable to sue the federal government for negligence, even mm -hmm. though the government was negligent yeah. in using this product. <clears throat> But that that's just one of the substances, and then then there was um, the Gulf War syndrome that took place, and that was a, a variety of substances, the, including the the burning of, of waste material, mm -hmm. burning. And they would put their garbage into these big pits and burn it, and and would that include like chemical garbage and and excess stuff that got burned and uh, yeah, anything, and, yeah, anything would, would go into it, and and. Uh, in fact, President Biden refers to his son, Bo Biden, as being injured by war wow. in the Gulf War. In, in, by, in the Gulf War. Yeah. And he's been criticized that, well, his son was not shot. Yeah. But his son was exposed to these chemical toxins and did develop brain cancer. Wow. And unfortunately passed away. Mm. So uh, President Biden is was is correct in that mm -hmm. in that in that uh, analysis in my opinion uh other other sources of neurotoxicity from war include the shells that are used to fire against tanks mm -hmm. to penetrate tank walls these shells are can, can be made with hardened hardened uranium from uh, the refuse uh -huh. from uh, uh, the nuclear power plants. They take the waste and they use it to harden the metal yeah. for these shells. And then shells explode and they leave the the hardened, the, the radioactive material all, all around there, contaminating the soldiers mm -hmm. and anyone who comes upon it later. So in addition to that, I've had, I've worked with veterans from um, Camp Lejeune uh -huh. and, other, and other bases where there was contaminated water supply mm -hmm. because the federal government is not subject to OSHA, Occupational Safety and Healthy Administrative Laws. So they, they, they can pollute uh -huh. with abandoned and and unfortunately the federal government does has done that in the past contaminating the water supply and for for the service mm -hmm. service uh, workers and i've worked on a number of those cases and helped um uh, help those workers help those uh, veterans get their compensation and now the government though has now opened up the uh the compensation window so now many Oh, good. That are able to get compensation for these injuries. What kinds of things were in the water supply? Was it multiple chemicals or so, solvents? Okay, um, mm -hmm. tetra or trichloroethylene. Yep, that was, I guess, used for degreasing. Yes, degreasing aircraft or degreasing um, uh, armaments. Uh -huh. uh, I think that was the main contaminant in the water supply. Wow. And then just to round out the, mm -hmm. the cases, then then I've worked on a case of uh, a veteran who was tasked with cleaning out the fuel tanks of jet planes, mm -hmm. and he the government did not give him adequate Pretty respiratory equipment, and he would he would go into these chambers and. Uh, come out and pass out.
character. He did, he hadn't had it before yeah. the exposures. And afterwards, he he did well, he as I was saying, he was acquitted and and he was judged temporarily insane. And he spent many years in a psychiatric hospital. And then actually he recently contacted me and he's out of the hospital and he's he's trying he's trying to resume his life now. So wow. and it, it was horrible because he killed a family member. Oh wow. And, well, it just goes to show, I think the moral here is that these chemicals in our environment have such a profound effect on our health. And in the case of what you witnessed, they have a profound effect on personality, on mental acuity, on cognition, um, on even memory. Because um, I bet there's some cases where many of these people under certain influence of chemicals can hardly remember, you know, what they even did. Um, so it's, it's really profound. And like I said, I think our... Um, awareness around it is important because as medical doctor, you know, we want to help patients clear this from their system, get out of exposures. I always say kind of at the beginning, you talked about um, breathing clean air. And I always say clean air, clean water, clean food. And really it's up to us to make sure our government isn't going to protect us. <laughs> Unfortunately, they just don't have the bandwidth and they're not checking chemicals in synergy. And they're not really, again, doing due diligence for a lot of these things that are being put into the environment, as, as I'm sure you can tell. So it's up to us. <laughs> it's up to us. Um, what in all of your years of experience has been the most profound? Like, like if you were to talk to our listeners that are, whether they're patients or people that are just living in this environment, what would be your big takeaway for everyone listening? Uh, well, what I would say, I would say a couple of things. One is, it, it's it takes a while for the medical establishment to uh, to understand the effects of toxic substances. And when I started out in my practice, there was exceedingly few doctors mm -hmm. who had any knowledge of this or any willingness to to study it. And nowadays, yes, there are. Doctors like you and 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 a handful of others that do have this understanding. So, if if a listener thinks that they have a toxic chemical problem, and they go and they're seeking out medical help, I do urge them to seek out doctors that specialize in this area. Otherwise, you're going to get blank stares. You're going to get because the medical doctors don't they don't know they don't understand. They it's not in their they're not really paid in a sense to, to understand this. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Let's put that aside. The training is just, and I'm 20 years out, the but training. there's yeah. no the, training. There really isn't. <laughs> when I, when I was, when I was at Mount Sinai School of Medicine, what, what I learned was the average medical doctor had four, four hours of training in environmental or occupational medicine. Wow. And I hope it's changed since then. Yeah. Maybe a little more, maybe eight or 12, but not much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it really is. And everything that I've learned about this kind of medicine has been mostly postgraduate. So it is true. You have to really understand. And although more and more, I mean, part of my passion in being here with you is educating. We have a lot of practitioners who listen too. So the more doctors that can get curious and start to say, well, what if, even if they don't know everything about it, if they can just see a patient's symptoms. And for me, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, but a history is everything. Because if I say, oh, at this point, either in a new environment, a new house, a new exposure, and and that changed a behavior or symptom dramatically from that time forward, that could be involved, right? So you take a great history, you can often tell if there's an environmental exposure that could be at the root. Yeah. As in fact, as my practice in neurotoxicology has evolved over the years, I rely more and more on history and and the, the details. I I if someone is in litigation and they come to see me, they they spend a day and a half or two days in my office with me and my staff mm -hmm. getting tested and talking about what did, what exactly happened? Yeah. What are the symptoms you have? Mm -hmm. When did they start? What are they like? Because I find that that gives me more, more information than the tests sometimes. Uh, I could not agree more. Most of the times um, I am a mold expert. So I diagnose a lot of, diagnose a lot of mold toxicity. And I would say 100% of the time in the history, I usually know the diagnosis. Now that's 
not science-based. So, well, our intuition may be a little bit, but I actually prove it with the test. So I actually go back and make sure that we're really dealing with that. But my staff jokes about my my percentage of accuracy is almost 100% because when you really listen and you're listening to the patient and you put it together, you can usually have a pretty good idea of what is causing or what is contributing to their illness before you even prove it with the testing. And I'm sure you do the same just listening. I, I totally mm -hmm. agree. Mm -hmm. um, amazing. I am so grateful for you, for your time, for your work in the world. Um, uh, I'm assuming people can find you at your website, neurotox.com and E-U-R-O-T-O-X.com. We'll leave that link. Is there anywhere, anything else you'd like to share with our audience or anywhere else that they can find you or get more information? Uh, they could pick up my book, yes. Neurotoxicity Guidebook, which is available on Amazon. And I wrote this book at the beginning of my career, but it, it's when I look back and read it, it still rings true. Yeah. So these things do. So you. Neurotoxicity Guidebook, we will link to that. Um, I'm going to get myself a copy. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you again for the work you do in the world. Thank you for, because um, this is hard work. And and from the um, experience you've shared with us, these are not easy cases. Like you've dealt with some really tough subjects, but I'm grateful there's people out there like you doing this work. And I'm grateful for you who's doing <laughs> doing the work of treating all these all these patients who 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 have no nowhere else to go really, oh. and who find help with your services. Thank you. Well, please go out and buy a copy of uh, Dr. Singer's book, and we'll link to that. And thanks again for being on the show. You're welcome. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Resiliency Radio. I hope you enjoyed the interview with Dr. Singer as much as I did. Stay tuned for future episodes. We release a new episode every week. You can watch us on YouTube. You can listen on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And please do stop by, leave a review. It helps us reach more people. Join us again next week for another guest. If you want more information for transcripts, downloads, you can go to jillcarnahan.com. For products and services, go to drjillhealth.com. And I hope to see you again next week.